All right. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, coming to the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, we are uh, delighted today to have a distinguished panel to discuss uh, the situation uh, in the Kurdistan region in Iraq and in the wider region. Um, my name is Saran Hamas Said. I'm a senior program officer with the Middle East and Africa uh, Center of USIP. I also lead the Iraq program at the Institute. So uh, you will be hearing today from uh, a, a panelists who have been in Iraq, working in Iraq, but also organizations that have been in Iraq, worked in Iraq, and continue to work uh, in Iraq. The U.S. Institute of Peace uh, has been working in Iraq since 2003 and continued our work uh, so, since then. Most of you are familiar with our program, so I will not go uh, into a lot of detail uh, on that. And uh, uh, we have uh, two distinguished uh, speakers from the Middle East Research Institute uh, from the Kurdistan region. We have uh, Professor Dlaur uh, Aladdin, who uh, I have a lot of admiration for, for his uh, work, for his uh, ideas. He's a man of ideas and a man of action, turning those ideas into action. He, I've seen him do that through uh, publications, and even well before going into the Kurdistan regional government, I have seen him do that while a minister of higher education in the Kurdistan regional government, and I see him do that uh, as a president and a founder of the Miri uh, uh, Institute. Uh, and uh, his colleague, Samuel uh, Morris, who is a fellow, research fellow at, the, at, uh, at Miri, uh, has been working there and uh, uh, working on the displaced issue territory and uh, other aspects of, the, uh, of Miri. I'll uh, uh, let them uh, in a minute to uh, discuss and talk about uh, their work. And we're also here privileged to have uh, Dr. Ilya Bouon, who is the Middle East uh, Programs Director for at the Institute of Peace. Uh, he re was uh, recently in uh, Erbil and Baghdad, part of a senior uh, uh, USIP delegation uh, that met with a range of, uh, of, of uh, actors, uh, including top level, the, the top level leadership in the Kurdistan region, meeting with President Barzani and uh, also in Bag uh, and the Deputy Prime Minister and others in Baghdad, uh, again, the President Masoum. Uh, Prime Minister Abadi, Speaker al Jaburi, and, uh, and many others. Uh, so he is also coming uh, uh, with insights uh, from uh, the, the region and also uh, a long standing experience in Iraq and the wider Middle East uh, program uh, in his capacity as a USIP uh, uh, staff and also uh, president of the Arab Human Rights uh, 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 Fund, uh, and well before that with other organizations. Uh, for today, I think uh, we have a diverse audience here for, uh, from, from the think tank community, from the government, and, and from USIP as well. And uh, people that who follow Iraq with interest, they are engaged and work on Iraq. Uh, so I, I think this uh, allows us to get into really discussing in depth what, what's happening. And, and Professor and to the panelists, uh, one thing I would uh, the format of the day will be uh, for about uh, six, seven minutes per panelist to, to get, give some introductory remarks, and then we'll go dive into uh, questions and answers right after that. Uh, and just for uh, uh, we are plan this uh, meeting is on the record, uh, so uh, you are free to use the content uh, for publications or for uh, your work. And we are also recording uh, the, the 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 event. Uh, hopefully, if the video quality turns out we may also make it available uh, on our website. Um, and uh, we are writing, our uh, colleague Gopal is uh, writing a piece about, uh, about the discussion uh, uh, as well. Uh, one thing as uh, the delegation uh, or the MIRI team was coming to DC, some developments happened in the Kurdistan region about uh, the political uh, uh, discussions uh, there led uh, to a sort of a dead end uh, at some point. And it, it triggered, so the, the turn of events demonstrations and a limited scope of violence started triggering a question uh, for some that it, where, where are we going from here? Uh, so for quite some time, uh, you would look at the Middle East and the wider region. Uh, if there was a lot of transition, a lot of instability. You would look at the Kurdistan region and Tunisia are the two places that would give you hope of where things might be going. Uh, so now, with some of the, the recent developments in the Kurdistan region, uh, it, 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 uh, those who follow the situation over there raise the question, okay, the political transition, and then you have the fight against the, the Islamic State. How are they going to affect each other? Uh, and if you take a step back in the, just in the past few months, 
you look at the south of Iraq uh, the, and the demonstrations and, 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 and the reform uh, agenda that has been triggered there, you look at the developments in south Turkey, southeastern Turkey, and the, the peace talks basically uh, reaching some sort of a end and the violence that you see there. There are talk about um, a, 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 a third intifada uh, in, the, uh, in the Israeli-Palestinian uh, context. So the, then t if you look at the region and say, okay, we had a big problem called the Islamic State uh, or ISIL and uh, with the ramification of that massive displacement. Then we had areas that have been relatively stable that may be destabilizing for, for, for various reasons. Not necessarily related, I'm not trying to suggest a theory here, but that it sh for peace builders, for those who are working in the region, the, the landscape has just gotten more complex. Uh, so with that, uh, I will uh, leave it to the floor to uh, Professor Aladdin. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm delighted. And But special thanks to USIP and UCAC Serhang and uh, Dr. Ali Yabuan. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be back here. I was here last year in your magnificent building, um, and I know many people were envious of your spacious, beautiful facade here. Um, and uh, uh, also, I was grateful to um, meet with uh, uh, Ms. Nancy Lindbergh uh, in Erbil. Uh, that really renewed our interest and um, led to this meeting. Um, I will briefly touch on a few things, uh, some of which um, you alluded to, um, but to begin with, I'd like to introduce uh, Mary to you. Um, obviously, my colleague was introduced, and I have three more colleagues here, uh, Fuad Smail and uh, Siobhan uh, is our com uh, communications co coordinator, and we have Hogar, who is a research assistant here. Um, right. Uh, and as an organization, uh, we are indeed a policy research institute. We, are, um, uh, we have been established for about a year and a half. Um, our uh, starting coincided with a lot of development and, of course, uh, a, a new emerging nation aspiring to be democratic needs a lot of think tanking, a lot of policy research, a lot of direction, vision, strategy, evidence-based um, policies. And we found ourselves very busy as soon as we started. Um, so our focus, although our mission is really to do with peace, stability, human rights, nation building, and rule of law, and so on, uh, but we uh, chose to uh, engage uh, policy makers, decision makers in the government, outside government, civil society, uh, public, private sector. So we initiated a lot of projects um, ranging from reforming and institutionalizing uh, Peshmerga forces, uh, judiciary system, public prosecutors, uh, all the way to uh, protecting women from violence and legislating for that, as well as training police officers to be more accountable and more transparent. So that is really hands-on uh, engagement with the government, um, as well as engaging the international uh, uh, counterparts, whether they are universities or or policy research people to do fundamental research on the ground, again designed to have practical applications and translating policy into practice. Uh, we also um, touch on uh, many areas of conflict, and we try to resolve conflict. For example, our report on Kharkov, which Sam will talk about, as well as um, enshrining the minorities' right in the uh, constitution and legislation, and trying to. Um, uh, ensure that they share the ownership of decision making as well as the entire country and that again Sam will talk about the details of that. Um, <clears throat> so in many ways we we have been lucky to have uh, natural partners in national and international and we have been doing joint research with joint publications and, and joint uh, policy reports and I'll be delighted to talk about these in detail with anyone interested after this. Um, in, in, in the Middle East, um, uh, I'm glad that we're talking about, we're talking to a panel of experts, so you, you already know a lot about it, so I'm, I'm going to assume a lot of knowledge uh, rather than try and patronize everybody. But I come in at the top and, and drop a few buzzwords and, and just to say that these are open for discussion. If you want, you can then indulge in greater detail. 
What we do see is that, indeed, um, not just the landscape is changing in the Middle East, uh, uh, but as you will know, the entire Middle East order that had been stagnant for decades is now in transition. And we are talking about uh, a sudden, uh, although it took a long time until it boiled and, uh, and, and suddenly led to uh, um, uh, a kind of uh, relatively chaotic descent, um, but actually, uh, we may well be um, witnessing uh, a milestone in history that uh, the entire Middle East order is now uh, changing, uh, taking new shape. But who's going to shape it is what matters to us. With the United States uh, effectively keeping a long distance from, from events, um, keeping an arm's length and uh, not providing leadership uh, uh, after having been actually very... Uh, directly engaged for almost a decade, especially after removal of Saddam until 2011. America was leading uh, and, and, and dictating the agenda, but since 2011, there is a void now which is uh, filled by regional powers like Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and they are now shaping the new Middle East order. And left alone, we may see even more chaos, more violence, and more um, disintegration and dismemberment of countries like Syria, like possibly Iraq and the region. So as we are in transition, uh, we really think that uh, superpowers, um, especially United States and Europe, they need to come in and shape that future. For us, uh, of course, we are in the middle of it. We are often said we are landlocked. Indeed, we are uh, neighbors to many of these regional powers who are now um, trying to, through their rivalry, to shape the future, but none of them have nation building in mind, none of them have democracy in mind, so they are now tearing the place apart. And we, as a small nation, uh, as an emerging nation, uh, inevitably will either fall victim of that kind of rivalry and uh, dynamic change, or we become part of it. But uh, you will have known that Kurds. Um, uh, have not and refuse to be proxies to regional powers, but they've always engaged the regional powers for their survival. They've always needed to have good relations, uh, but they're all tough neighbors we had. Iran is one of the most difficult neighbors we've ever had, but we have to live with it, we have to engage uh, peacefully so that we both are winners uh, or survivors or, and have good neighborly relations. And the same thing goes to Turkey. So we need to have good trade relations, economic relations, political relations. And I'm glad that to say that with Kurdish as well as um, uh, Turkish uh, in, uh, initiatives, we managed to transform Turkish approach to Kurdistan from a security point of view to an economic and political one. Although tensions are rising and they're, they're, this is not deep enough for it to be just you know, permanently entrenched, but it, it, it takes time. And we are hoping that we do exactly the same with uh, Iran, that relations will be more political, economic, rather than security-based. But then again, both Turkey and Iran have their own global agenda. They have bigger things to worry about, and we are not in the big picture. Uh, but we try not to be uh, absorbed into their um, global uh, um, rivalry with America, with Israel, with Turkey, and, and all of that. I, I would be happy to talk about this, but I, I want to remind you that um, at the moment in our neighborhood is, there are so many hotspots that uh, are like spanners in the work that they are wrecking the place and they are uh, polarizing these nations and communities and we need to deal with these ourselves directly because everything happens on our land. Like for example in Turkey when violence started again. Um, when um, uh, when these, uh, the, the peace process um, was uh, well, ended effectively, then um, all these um, uh, wars and violence and bombardments happened on Iraqi Kurdistan soil as well as Syria and Turkey. So that wrecks or complicates matters for us in, in, in both uh, sides of the border. Uh, Syria, we all know um, there were um, where it was and where it's going, and with the Russian intervention and Iraq's engagement with Russia and Iran and, and this new uh, cooperation uh, clearly will have impact on Kurdistan region, and uh, we need to uh, manage this uh, well enough uh, not to be affected negatively by it, but maybe positively by it. Uh, Syria, 
we can talk about, especially with developments with PYD, but uh, Iraq and Kurdistan region are of particular interest to us. I have to emphasize, we are not behaving like a Kurdish uh, policy uh, research institute. We are Middle Eastern, we engage the Middle Eastern leaders, we collaborate with the Middle Eastern think tanks, but we are present in Kurdistan, we are funded by uh, money coming from a capacity building grant that is, comes out of the Oil and Gas Council. It is unconditional, that keeps us impartial and independent, but it is actually coming out of the pot that is in Kurdistan. So that's why we're based there and our focus is there and that's probably our strength in knowing having better insight about our own local issues, but engage the international community. I was in Baghdad uh, a couple of weeks ago, up until about uh, a week ago, um, and I met a lot of people, uh, including speakers of the parliament, president of Iraq, and a few ministers, and so on. Um, I did develop the sense that uh, Baghdad is um, um, going round in a vicious circle. Uh, they are under great pressure from the street as well as from the religious uh, authorities there, Marja'i and Najaf, to do something to reform the, the, the system, but they are just not capable of it. It's just not possible, not easy. The um, uh, relations between components in Iraq, Sunni, Shia, Kurds, have not improved. The confidence building uh, is rock bottom, not happening. And uh, the government is now suffering or, or coming under the overwhelming pressure of so many crises, one of which, for example, is financial, with the oil uh, price drop and the lack of economic uh, structure and potential to uh, recover. It's been really difficult, and the prospect is, gr is grim. The security um, uh, prospect is again grim because uh, Iraq lost its army and now that void is uh, filled by Hashta Shabi and militias and they are uh, dependent on Iraqi money but answerable to uh, uh, other than state, i.e. answerable to people outside the state. That really undermines the state's uh, ability to govern, to rule, to provide security. Politically, Iraq is effectively, dis you know, it's no longer a member of the international community. It has lost its ability to make its own decisions. So Iraq uh, is now um, uh, effectively not only dysfunctional, but also unable to uh, determine its own destiny. And things are not improving, and Iraq or Baghdad has not been able to provide alternative political solutions to re-engage the Sunnis, to provide hope for the populations that are now occupied under, uh, under ISIS and for uh, and Baghdad has been like this and the uh, indications are that they will remain like this for a long time to come. So broken Iraq and a broke Iraq as well as uh, unable to solve uh, uh, or lead uh, itself into uh, out of this uh, these crises and into solution. Kurdistan, for a long time, for well over 10 years, was way ahead of Baghdad in every sense, in terms of uh, nation building and establishing democracy, uh, or aspiring to, uh, as well as rule of law. So in every way, it was making better progress, even economically. However, the, uh, the uh, again, you don't need to remind me, I'm fully aware of my time, but I'm, I, I, I'm reading, reaching the crunch, so I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of that. Um, Kurdistan region suffers from the same kind of crisis as Baghdad, okay, and in, and it had the ability to to do something about, it, still has, but recently internal crisis rendered uh, the KRG unable to deal with external. I believe external crisis is always opportunity, like Daesh came allowed provided the incentive to institutionalize Peshmerga uh, and, and re ra radically uh, rethink the entire armed forces uh, arrangements. Uh, the financial crisis uh, provided incentive to restructure the economy. Uh, bad relations with Baghdad provided incentive for uh, more economic independence. But all these uh, opportunities were not taken. Uh, KRG was very slow to respond to these and were uh, effectively these were not seen well they were not used as, as um, unique opportunities. Now, external crisis, as I said, can strengthen you, but internal crisis can actually undermine you, and that's exactly what happened. I'll be happy to talk about the root causes of the crisis, 
uh, the crisis is not what it seems, uh, is not what how it's displayed in the media, and and therefore even when friends came to help, they came in help in the wrong way, <coughs> and they made it worse. And I do not believe that uh, the way forward is to tackle the subject as if it's a personal thing, as if it's a one person wanting to stay in power or not. It's nothing to do with that. It's all to do with power sharing arrangements. It's to do with the future, not to do with one person. And I'll be happy to talk about that. And that view may well be different from what the political parties say, or the leaders told, tell you, or the media people, or even the ones who beat to Kurdistan and back. It has nothing to do with that. And finally, what I would say is that um, we cannot afford to watch Kurdistan uh, uh, lose this opportunity, lose the momentum, and, and lose the ability to be a great partner to the rest of the world in not just the war against Daesh, but also in democracy. Therefore, our friends can do a lot, um, and there's plenty that is expected of the United States. Um, what can they do? Again, I'll leave it for questions and answers, but I do have very clear mind about what they can do. What are the priorities in Kurdistan? Again, all to do with crisis, Peshmerga, IDPs, political, all of that. So United States can do a lot to help, help itself for its own national security reasons, but help the partner for, to serve that purpose. And people around this table coming from the organizations that I just heard from Kaik Sarhan, I think there's plenty you guys can contribute in a very constructive way. What we want is one word, constructive engagement of our partners in, in America. That's actually a sentence, not a word. So <laughs> constructive engagement of partners, uh, good friends uh, with Kurdistan's leaders is what it takes to make sure that they do the right thing for that country, for our country, and for the United States in the future. Sorry if I no, no, put no, no, too no. much to talk about. Um, I'll okay. cut it from Sam's share. <laughs> <laughs> so Sam, <laughs> always have well, to. <laughs> thank you, thank you. It shows uh, if Delal was stealing my minutes, he's no Bernie Sanders. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but but look, I'd, I'd like to thank you all for, for coming to, to listen to us speak. I'd like to thank our hosts at USIP for hosting us. Um, it's very kind. Um, I think some of the words said by Acher Sahang in the beginning when he said that the situation is getting more complex for peace builders, I think is quite diplomatic. I think it's getting quite depressing over the last weeks and months. Things are, are really, really taking a turn. And maybe uh, that feeds into, um, I'll say a few words about why and how we approach our work and then lead into uh, our reports here. But I will keep it short, uh, bearing in mind that we'll want to talk not only about this, but also about those key issues that Lawa has spoken about. Um, we approach our work in a way that identifies that at the moment there is a clear lack of, of political solutions, creative, pragmatic political solutions across the Middle East. I think that's clear. You look at everywhere across the Middle East. In Syria, um, the focus is on military solutions. People are talking less and less about how to find a pragmatic political solution. In Iraq, the fight against ISIL, same situation. Everyone's focused on military solutions, but yet nobody is discussing, or very few people are discussing, how to come around with political solutions that really, really address the problematic social, cultural issues that, that are the underlying factors and the only way to find true peace in Iraq and find a true solution. Um, guns alone won't do that. Same in the Kurdistan region. Recently, as you've seen, um, um, small violent protests um, and sadly moving away from negotiations. Um, all of these sort of stem into why and how we do our work. We identify that there are key issues, key issues that need political solutions. Um, we work on, instead of being very broad and, and writing reports about um, the Middle East in general, we try to identify those key issues and, and come up with some creative ideas um, and try to think a bit out, outside of the box to try and actually find policy recommendations for international actors, for local actors, and for local governmental actors as well as grassroots actors um, to try and find some sort of solution for these issues that um, are built upon progressing democratization, human rights, stability, security. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I would like everyone here to take the opportunity. We have hard copies of our two recent reports. Um, and also, um, keep us in mind, we'll have more and more reports coming out on different um, topics. But since we brought these two with us, I'll discuss these two reports. 
Um, the first is on the future of Kirkuk. Um, I'm sure all, all of you know about the issue of Kirkuk and the fact that it's such a, a difficult, um, prolonged, um, complex ethno-territorial issue. I think it's probably one of the most complex in the world. Um, the way we approached our work was um, identifying that the situation has changed oh, since June 2014. In base issue is that the security situation has changed. It's gone from being in control of well, this, at least half of the city and half the government being in control of the government to now being in control of the Kurds. Um, so we went in almost immediately after then and spent a lot of time on the ground talking to all political actors, local actors from all through, well, multiple communities, but obviously the three main communities being Turkmen, Kurd, and Arab. Um, so what we wanted to identify was whether change, any change had, had really come in perception. So the security situation has changed, everything has changed, but attitudes had, have been quickly changing across Iraq. So had attitudes been changing towards solutions for Kukuk? Um, so we went in and had multiple interviews with grassroots actors looking at their attitudes towards top-down political strategies. Unfortunately for Kukuk, um, a lot of International bodies, a lot of local bodies have produced a lot of good work. I, I, I will also highlight USIP has done a lot of great work. I mean, some of their reports are actually referenced in, in, uh, in our report. Um, but however, things have stagnated. You have a constitutional, constitutional ar article that is almost designed to not go anywhere. It doesn't tackle any of the tricky issues of voter eligibility, borders, referendum question. Um, and technically it ran out in two se December 2007 anyway. So our approach was, okay, we will use a framework of Article 140 because that is the go-to for everyone that references it. It also gives it constitutional legitimacy in some respects. And as when, when we were down in Kirkuk and talking to a number of Kirkukis, they also said, look, it's imperfect, but hey, Article 140 is all we've got. Um, so. The report in, in front of you um, tries to navigate the, the Article 140, putting in some creative ideas of how we get to a referendum on Cook Cook, because ultimately the future of Cook Cook is for Cook Cookies to decide, and I don't think anybody can argue that. Um, so we built in a number of mechanisms to try and, and uh, get through these three-step process of normalization, census, referendum. Um, we can go deeper into that if people are more interested in Cook Cook. I will let maybe some qu the more finite details of that be, be asked in the question and answer, but I'm also quite aware that people want to focus on the, the current events and, and other issues. Um, so that is one report. The second report is um, about minorities. Obviously, Kurdistan, quite rightly so, is viewed as a sort of safe haven bastion for the minorities, and, and, and it is. I mean, due to its tolerance, to its security and stability since 2003, um, it is um, a, a hub for the minorities. But since 2014, what you see is these at-risk groups, and uh, bear in mind that, uh, as you all know, Ir Iraq is one of the last places where you have some of these fascinating small, endangered minority groups, Yazidis, Khaki's, Mandaean, Shabak. These are ancient, ancient religions. That it's the last place that they are actually indigenously from based there. Um, so I think it's all of us have to build some way to protect these minorities before they leave. Because if they leave, they never go back. And that is the, that, that's for the detriment of Iraq, for the detri detriment of Kurdistan, it's the detriment for the, of the world for this to happen. So with that in mind, uh, we, we identified that while Kurdistan is a, is a protector of minorities because of its stability, oh, there is an, there, we identified that there is an issue of, of uh, getting the voice of those minorities heard in the Kurdistan region, the, the levels of representation in the uh, Kurdistan regional government. At the moment, there are fixed seats for minorities in the Kurdistan regional government, 11 seats, I think, six for Christian groups, and five for Turkmen. Um, but that, obviously, as I said, the number of minorities, all these interesting, amazing groups, are unrepresented. And also, those representatives um, are MPs and, and active in legislative 
um, process, but they're not really active in the decision-making process, and there's no real lobbying body for minorities. So our proposal was to build two councils, one for ethnic minorities, one for religious minorities, built on uh, models from Eastern Europe, but changed to specifically fit Kurdistan, where these councils would have direct links, and, and ministers from relevant ministries would be party and on, on these councils, and also we'd have community representatives part of that. So what you'd see is hopefully a greater level of influence and lobbying from minority groups at the highest level of government, not necessarily part of government, but at least a mechanism for their voice to be heard. Because what is clear is that these groups at the moment are not scared, they're terrified. They're terrified for their future, they're terrified of what's happened recently. Um, so anything that can be, one, put these fears or allay these fears in any way, any mechanism um, would be beneficial to those communities. Um, I think I'll probably leave it there, but I would say uh, please pick up a copy of our reports and I hope uh, we can now discuss some of uh, the topics that Lowell mentioned. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that publications are placed there with, uh, with also some USIP publications if you want to uh, uh, pick them up. And also before I pass to uh, Eli, I, I forgot to mention that we have uh, Bayan Rahman, the representative of the KRG to the United States, uh, here. So thank you for, for joining us today. Thank you, Sarhan. Good morning. Uh, as Sarhan mentioned, I was part of the USIP's uh, leadership visit uh, last month to Iraq. The visit was a good opportunity to get a better understanding of the situation. And I'm saying a better understanding because I do think that Anyone who claims having a full understanding of the situation in Iraq and the region is either naive, misled, or trying to mislead others. So uh, the, best, the best bet is to have a better understanding, uh, nothing more. Uh, I, I'll go through a few points that I think are important uh, in today's situation in Iraq. They are, they are not a comprehensive assessment of the situation, just a few highlights from, from the visit. Uh, so the first one is about the protests that are happening in Baghdad and other parts of the country. Uh, despite the fact that these protests are um, an opportunity to build on, uh, we think that there are two distinct dynamics. Uh, there is one dynamic that is very specific to the protests happening in Baghdad. And these protests started as uh, basically, uh, or they started around uh, governance-related grievances. But until now, what, we, what we've noticed that they lack a unified vision and uh, they, lack, they lack a good understanding of the policy-making cycle in Iraq. And unless uh, these two issues are addressed, we don't think that these protests will lead to uh, significant policy changes. The protests that are happening at the provincial level have a slightly different nature <coughs> uh, because although many of them started as a genuine protest movement, but then uh, later on, they turned out to be a kind of a settlement of accounts between Shia political parties in, in most of the cases. So, and, and this is something, to, this dynamic has to be observed as well. Uh, when it comes to the reform packages introduced by the Prime Minister, we think that uh, they induced a positive shock into the, the political landscape in Iraq. However, uh, getting these reforms to the end will require legislative amendments, financial resources, and a large political constituency that are not uh, uh, available at this stage. Uh, uh, and we think that the Prime Minister uh, needs to work on these three elements before uh, raising more expectations about these reforms. On decentralization, uh, and this is a positive note, is that decentralization seems to be the only consensual issue in Iraq right now. Uh, all of the actors agree uh, that uh, there's no way they can go back to a centralized government. So everyone sees decentralization as uh, a way forward. However, this is being expressed and interpreted in, in many ways, ranging from uh, demands for full independence by the Kurdish political actors to autonomous regions by some Shia actors and to a, simply a decentralized government by other actors. So there is a need also to synchronize a little bit on what do we mean by decentralization and uh, what form uh, can it take. Uh, one important development that we notice is the emergence of a new 
Shia political dynamic or a new political dynamic within the Shia constituency, which is now obviously led by Prime Minister Abadi and the Marja'iya uh, through uh, Sayyid Sistani, but uh, we've noticed that it has some sort of a constituency at, at other levels. And this, if, if I want to describe this new dynamic, I would say that it's a dynamic that is not necessarily adversarial to the Iranian agenda, but at the same time, this dynamic is very keen on showing a distinct Shia, Iraqi Shia identity. Uh, so that is not adversarial to the Iranian agenda, but also clearly distinct from the Iranian uh, mainstream. Uh, and, and we think that this dynamic deserves uh, a lot of attention and possibly some support. Uh, there are a lot of efforts to set up a Sunni political platform in Iraq as a prerequisite for national reconciliation or national dialogue, and this makes sense. Uh, however, what, what we've noticed so far is that the efforts didn't lead to any positive outcome. Uh, we think that the, the attempts by themselves are positive, but we hope that this will lead to, uh, to one outcome at least. Uh, and as I said, we consider this as a prerequisite for any national dialogue or any national reconciliation that uh, will happen in Iraq. Uh, at the time when we visited the Kurdistan region last September, we uh, came out with the impression that uh, despite the presidential crisis, the actors accommodated themselves somehow to the idea that there will be a kind of a status quo for a couple of years at least. The recent events last week uh, made us question this assumption. Uh, but Dr. Dilauer, uh, just before we started, uh, confirmed to me that uh, things couldn't, couldn't escalate more than uh, what we've seen last week and that things will stabilize <coughs> somehow. Uh, and that was our understanding from uh, our interaction with the Kurdish political actors last September. One, uh, one thing that we've uh, we've always raised as a concern is the increased militarization of the communities in Iraq. We think that this, this is one of the biggest threats that Iraq will face in the coming, uh, in, the, in the near future. And it is very important to work on mitigating the effects and averting the consequences of this militarization. Uh, and and I, we think that it should be a priority for the international and local actors as well. Uh, we tried to raise the awareness of local actors during the visits about the danger of this trend. Uh, we hope that uh, we managed to do so. Uh, one other issue we raised also during the visits is uh, what is being understood by the concept of stabilization. Uh, for, many, for many international actors in Iraq today, stabilization means clearing areas uh, held by ISIS and then providing humanitarian support and uh, reconstructing uh, facilities and infrastructure. We think that these are very important, but stabilization should go beyond the, these two aspects. Uh, it should include working on building resilience and, uh, and social cohesion to prevent backsliding as a result of unfinished conflicts. And uh, the best example we give is uh, a pilot intervention that USIP led in Tikrit. Uh, and we call it, just to simplify, we call it the Spiker Initiative. Basically, it's an initiative to mitigate violence, uh, to, uh, sorry, to prevent further violence that could have uh, uh, happened because of the Spiker-based massacre. Uh, and the outcomes that uh, our initiative in, uh, that we implemented in partnership with our local partner, Sanat for Peace Building, are, uh, are quite indicative that this kind of work is needed in, in areas uh, that have been cleared from ISIS. Uh, national dialogue and reconciliation is a recurrent theme, uh, and it was a recurrent theme during our meetings. Uh, we think that uh, any national dialogue attempt should go beyond the technicalities of constitutional amendments or power sharing. It should, it should really tackle the issue of the social contract among Iraqis. We have a strong conviction uh, especially after this visit, that the social contract among Iraqis is not valid anymore. It needs to be redefined, and the best way to do it is through a national dialogue process. Uh, displacement is, a, as, as you all know, is a huge issue in Iraq and in KRG specifically. Uh, 
everyone acknowledges that the, we're in a, in, a, in a context of a protracted crisis in Iraq and protracted displacement, but I think the international community has the duty to make sure that this protracted displacement doesn't lead to demographic changes in Iraq. Uh, any new demographic change in Iraq will lead to more conflicts. Uh, the topic of minorities uh, was also a, a, a hot topic in, in our visits. Uh, uh, it's, very, it's very hard to recommend what should be done for the minorities in Iraq, and, and probably the best sentence uh, is the one we heard from one of the minority leaders in Iraq who said, we really don't know what to do. If we leave Iraq, we would have left our land, our history, our identity, if we stay here in this situation of displacement, we are also losing our identity and history. And he basically said, we don't know what to, we don't know what to recommend. We don't know what we want anymore. Uh, I think that one of the mistakes of many minority leaders in the past year was to come to the US and other uh, countries requesting a military protection for minorities. I think that was neither realistic nor uh, relevant. But definitely, the international community should think about uh, a, an international framework to make sure that the minorities can go back home and can preserve their identity and history. Uh, just to end on, on, a, on a positive note, uh, I mean, I, I, I like the statement that says never waste a crisis. Uh, so Iraq and the Kurdistan region are in a crisis right now. Uh, I'm really looking forward to know from Dr. Dilawer what USIP can do in terms of, uh, of the engagement that you described. Uh, and we think that USIP and the US government should upscale their engagement in Iraq because uh, we don't want to waste this crisis. We want to build on it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Elite. Uh, just a quick note that uh, I'm told that the USIP President will make an effort to step out of meeting and come and say hello. So I, it may happen during the, uh, uh, the conversation. I want to pick up, uh, ask the first question as a, as a moderator uh, to on, on the common theme that came up with. You mentioned social contracts. Uh, you mentioned the the, the the decision of the Kirkukis uh, to be done by themselves. And uh, uh, Professor Delauri also mentioned about how. Uh, a change. It takes effort. It takes interaction of institutions, and and the and you, talk, you spoke about the, the changing order in the in, in the Middle East for quite some time. Many people felt was an, an imposed order, and you talked about power sharing and and all, all these ingredients: power sharing, social contract. Uh, the, 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 the many people advocated from a bottom up how you build it up uh, from from the ground. So whether the Kurdistan region building itself up, and then you have the Shia. And the Sunnis building, and you tie that so, 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 through some sort of uh, power sharing. Uh, I'll leave it to you whether you want to talk about it through the, uh, the, the Kurdistan as an example, or Iraq, or both. Uh, I would like to pose this to, to both of you. And, and you said the constructive engagement of others, and tying back uh, to Ibi's question. Uh, for those who are outside, who want to be constructive, to, to have a constructive engagement, what would that look like? I know the extreme for from this part of the world was, okay, military engagement that enable gives you leverage, uh, but the conversation from the Middle East. I'm from that part of the world. Uh, it's not about military. It's about so many other ways that the, the, the friends could be helpful. Sure. Um, wh how does the bottom up look like, and what help will be specifically helpful, whether in the political transition or in the capacity building of institutions? Thank you. Well, <clears throat> I'm sure people around this table will have their own ideas, um, and different people will look at the same picture in different ways. Um, I personally think that um, uh, we are experiencing a new trend, new development, new um, dynamics, uh, and uh, people in the Middle East, including Kurdistan, need to learn new tricks, how to then stabilize uh, the region, how to reach... Um, uh, stability, uh, coexistence, as well as democratization. The the depth of democracy, depth of um, nation building and, and, and institutionalization is not that great for it to tolerate sudden twists and turns. Um, the, the AK Party in Turkey, for example, worked for the last 10, 12 years on 
um, uh, making uh, Turkey more democratic, building better economy, and then initiating a peace process. And all that was destroyed over three weeks. Uh, ten years' work, uh, ten days' uh, <coughs> violence and, det and deterioration. Kurdistan region, since the end of the internal fighting in 1998, it took about seven, eight years until the two administrations united, and then it, the last 10 years there have been serious investment in confidence building, institutionalizing, and uniting the two administrations, and it genuinely did, because parliament, government, obviously it's a, a permanent coalition status, because there's no single party that can win outright and rule. But this uh, 10 years process, um, suddenly 10 days of uh, deadlock and deterioration violence, as if we are likely to go back to two administration days and threatens to take us back to the 90s. Now, in Iraq, 10 years of uh, constitution, adoption, democracy, legislation, all of that, and then suddenly ISIS emerged uh, within a few weeks destroyed. So what does that tell you? It tells you that we need to go bottom up as well as top down. We need to be horizontally as well as vertically working on this institutionalization. It will take time. It will not be easy. But one thing I'm sure about is that left alone, we can't do it. We have failed. Left alone, Iraqis failed to sort Iraq out. Left alone, Kurds may well fail to sort it out because it's complex. Left alone, Syria will not sort itself out. Turkey will not sort it out. So a superpower that is seriously interested in peace, I'm not saying democracy though, but seriously interested in peace in the region, should be more closely engaged rather than leave it all to its own accord or to other superpowers to say, okay, we are not the only superpower in the world. Well, that approach has been detrimental. Um, accepting that left alone we may not find our way easily, uh, given the complexity of region, we are in a very, very tough, tough neighborhood. No other neighborhood is as tough as that. Over the, over the last, what, centuries has been like that. Now, the United States approach uh, as, as a superpower has been really um, in, in many ways dealing with real politics of the day uh, in, in over, the cent over the decades but now um, uh, the way that the, the current administration handled Iraq's complexity uh, has been really um, the consequences of that have been very dire, very um, expensive on us too uh, in Baghdad in 2011, the decisions that were made, the uh, renewal of, the, of Maliki's second term, all of these were, uh, they, they happened after a judgment made here that this is the best thing for US and Iran. So a lot of these things happened, and, and in Kurdistan, again, the engagement of arriving at the last minute, do a little bit with minimalistic approach, it's not going to help, it has to be sustained. Now, Everybody in Kurdistan is grateful for United States uh, sacrifices, contribution, uh, engagement, and they have been really uh, vital for, for survival of this uh, nation. I mean, last year, Daesh could have occupied Erbil had it not been for the American intervention and the Allies. But saving them from that danger and, 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 and uh, uh, establishing some partnership, a limited partnership, is one thing. But actually making this partner better democratic, better institutionalized, better established, and uh, have better future is another. At the moment, the United States' approach is too distant, too minimalistic, and too remote. We, we need, for the sake of both the United States and Kurdistan, we need greater, closer engagement, because we think that whatever happens in Kurdistan and Iraq is directly linked to the national security interest of the United States of America. And again, the same thing happens to Iraq, rather than say, in black and white, you guys must deal with Baghdad, and, and Baghdad is in a mess, but you have no choice but to go there. That's again not, not helping. So my point is, um, um, whether it's USIP, whether it's uh, um, NGOs and, and, and funding bodies, those who are interested in peace, or it's government, people in Kurdistan need closer mutual understanding com and, and, and joint uh, approaches. Uh, so you, you mentioned Kirkuk, uh, we mentioned Kirkuk, uh, IDPs, internally displaced people, the short and intermediate and long-term um, approach to those. Kurdistan government is very new. 
it's although people think it's 22, 23 years old, but actually the ex experience of governance at, with the current setup is only 10 years old. Uh, and before that, we were never a state. We were never we never had the uh, experience uh, of running uh, or self-governing a state that was uh, that had institutions that might have been derailed but come back. No, we never had that. And our leaders are the same leaders who were people in the mountains f fighting for our freedom, and they were professional destroyers of Iraq state. Suddenly they were in charge of establishing new state, uh, establishing institutions. So does that not tell you that we need help? And if we suddenly face crisis, face challenges uh, that are often regional or global, we <coughs> cannot handle them on our own. So we are actors, strong actors on the ground but we are not global or regional actors to the level of uh, trying to uh, find our way out of every crisis. So uh, friends and allies need to be there helping each other uh, in a sustainable manner over the long term. Thank you. Yeah, I'll say a few words. I mean, I think the, the key phrase that you mentioned was constructive engagement, and I think there is, is a gaping chasm for that at the moment. Um, I think if, if you leave it alone, you, you just get destructive engagement. Um, and if you just say, let's get you, it's up to you to get your house in order, and I'm going to watch it happen, um, I don't think you should expect the house to get in order. Um, this, you can make equations, obviously, in Iraq, and but in the Kurdistan region, um, there, there, there is a genuine, with all the wholesale changes that have happened, there's a, there's a fear for change, a fear of change politically. Um, so in the Kurdistan region, politics has not evolved. I think that's the problem. A lot of things evolved since 2003 for Kurdistan, a, a huge amount of benefits, but the politics stayed the same. And I think you're seeing that now play out. Um, and for the US, I think the US forgets, or maybe doesn't forget, but do, it, it has a huge level of influence politically. Militarily, huge amount of influence and support, and you see that Kurdistan region is, it, it needs air cover, it needs military support, and it is hugely reliant on that to a massive degree. But also, politically, the influence is there, and, and <coughs> the, the U.S. as such up to now, its engagement has, has politically has not been hugely constructive, I would say. I, I came into certain meetings, and whether perceptions were correct or uncorrect, it was seen as taking a side um, and really didn't help the situation at all. Kurdistan is a, is a stable, um, uh, hopefully in the future, a stable region that is an ally of the U.S. It, it, is, a, it is a great supporter of the U.S. and the U.S. Has a, should have a symbiotic relationship with it, not only militarily but politically. They should really try and steady the ship. Um, and they can do that through constructive engagement. The US will view it as an internal issue. This is an internal political issue that we want, don't want to get involved with. Um, that's very understandable. But when that starts impacting on uh, the US's main strategy, which if it is to degrade and defeat ISIS, ISIL, well then you need a steady partner in Kurdistan. You need steady partners on the ground in Iraq. Um, across Iraq. So, therefore, it, there comes a point where we go, this is an internal issue for Kurdistan, but also this is an internal issue that we're going to have to get involved with in a constructive manner to try and build stability and confidence on the ground. Yeah, and this discussion reminds me of my seven years old daughter who a few months ago was really upset with her mother, so she told her, I wish uh, I can live alone. So my wife decided to step out of the door. And then my, my daughter ran to her and told her, no, no, please, please come back. <laughs> uh, so 10 years ago, we would, have, we would have heard the same local actors addressing yeah. messages to the US and to the international community saying, please don't interfere anymore in our internal affairs. Leave us alone, imperialism, colonialism, etc." But that, that, that is all or none. That doesn't work. There is something between all or exactly. none. <laughs> so, uh, so I would say we need to be very careful in uh, lobbying for this strong US and international re-engagement in the region. Uh, I do think, and I mentioned this before, I do think that there is a role for the international community to play. But we really need to be careful on how this role is designed. 
and what's the scope of, of this work. Uh, and I think one, one of the missed opportunities, uh, and, and again, I think it's unfair to blame only the US for the failures in, in the region. I think many international actors uh, bear the shared responsibility of, of the situation today. But anyway, uh, two or three main ideas for any possible re-engagement of the international community and the US in, in Iraq and the regions that first, uh, there should be a focus on empowering and building the capacities of local actors. So it, it should be a mid-term re-engagement aiming at empowering and, uh, and building the capacities of local actors. I'm talking about political actors. I'm not talking about civil society only or, or other actors. I'm specifically talking about political actors. Because the past period was basically the international community coming to uh, to establish proxies for themselves and not to build the capacities of local art. The second thing is to acknowledge the, reali the realities of the region. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes is to uh, to try extrapolate from other contexts uh, to the region. Uh, and, and one of the recurrent examples that I always give is that there is no way any secular model would work in the region, at least, at least in the coming 50 years. There should be an acknowledgement that identity-based politics, whether we like it or not, is now the prevailing trend in the region, and any re-engagement, any political framework by the international community should take into account this reality. So these are a few examples of how uh, this re-engagement should be looked at instead of just a, like a blanket call for, for the engagement, which is scary somehow. Uh, thank you, Eli. So uh, uh, we'll open it up to questions from uh, the participants, and uh, I've had Rahman first and Mona uh, second. So uh, let me know uh, if, you, if you have questions. Rahman. Uh, Rahman, you go in National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, Dr. al you presented or promoted two partnerships with the U.S. One is the fighting ISIS, and the other one is the democracy. Uh, how do we trust a system that the Speaker of the Parliament of Kurdistan get sent back to Suleymaniya, and he's the speaker of the people. Four minister get kicked out of the government, and literally, you know, was told by individual, not institution, not court, not whatever, go back home. How do we trust you, or I'm talking the system, how do we trust democratization is Kurdistan uh, first agenda? Mm -hmm. I see a dictator. Yeah, so no, can answer that and we'll get to it. Well, I, um, this is a very Iraqi way of asking the question, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, basically, if one um, episode where two people did not do the right thing, therefore not trust the system, and they, that say Kurdistan does not deserve our help because two people were fighting, that is probably. Uh, putting a very big grim blanket on the whole thing. Um, Kurdistan, just like Iraq, are going through a tough period of transition. They are evolving. Democracy is evolving. The current crisis uh, is a serious one because it's about power sharing. And had this happened 20 years ago, they would have killed each other. They would have had rivers of blood. We are lucky to have these people behaving this way today. One says you go home, one says you're not a minister. Well, that is better than having bullets um, and destabilizations and then emerging red radicalism and leading to ISIS emerging. So essentially, when, um, when you see the, the way these negotiations have been conducted, none of us are happy or proud of the, the, the way they did it. But actually, this is Kurdistan emerging out of the past, which is violent, into a, a more civilized uh, debate. Remember the last three months, uniquely, Kurdistan debated this issue within the parliament. They were voting, one party winning one day, one party not winning. Debates behind closed doors, in open uh, uh, doors, uh, in front of the camera. The, the way it happened was uh, absolutely a, a wonderful, uh, promising sign that Kurdistan has moved away from uh, resolving conflict via uh, bullets and violence, and now it's a difficult gestation period, needs good midwife, but difficult gestation period to lead to a proper democracy. We do not have the deeper institutions of democracy with the 
legislative and the judiciary and all these um, independent court of rights. So we are going through this difficult phase and, and, and the symptoms of the problems and the era that we're experiencing, the symptom of this milestone, is just that kind of debate, that negative debate. We were unhappy that the way politicians polarized the nation. They were, we were unhappy about the way they dragged people into a negative atmosphere. But think about it in evolutionary terms. This is a dream for them to negotiate these things in this manner because uh, in the Middle East, especially Iraq, everything is sold through, through guns and through, through bloodshed. So for us to say, well, uh, a democratically elected Speaker of the Parliament was told by one individual to go home, therefore we, as the United States, should not trust Kurds, uh, that, that is the, that's slightly over the it's top. individual, it's the state. The, the state can be asked on Well, that is that the is the Middle East. Of Kurdistan is not individual. If you okay. say it is individual, then we all. No, you said individual. I didn't say these are parties. Uh, parties. Uh, these are parties between them, having a problem finding their way to a win-win solution. So this is uh, an entire, not just party, but their followers as well. So it's actually uh, it's it's much bigger than individuals. But these acts, tit for tat, happen in Kurdistan, anywhere else, but that is not uh, a justification to say, therefore, forget about them, keep a distance, let them to their own accord, because um, we're talking about uh, far bigger issues at stake, and and, um, and maybe uh, we're not, by the way, blaming anybody other than ourselves, uh, we're not blaming the United States, but uh, we, we have to remember that we're talking about an important area of the world emerging out of mayhem, trying to stabilize and establish democracy. Here's a partner on the ground, critical for anti-ISIS war, for anti-radicalism, for keeping some balance. And, and if you want to help yourself, you help the partner through to do the right thing. And uh, it is a difficult period. I mean, remember the United States went with big army to Iraq to do just that. It wasn't because the Arabs deserved it or the Iraqis deserved it. It was the right thing to do uh, for the world. So uh, my, our, my uh, reference earlier on Sam's was that uh, when the United States looked at this uh, crisis brewing, what did they do? They left it drag until the deadline of the 20th of August. And two days before that, or a day and a half before that, a delegation came from here and said, right, let's see who's right, who's wrong. They stayed awake until 6 a.m. in the morning uh, exhausted everybody, and then they pulled out. They said, okay, we think stability, we think this guy should stay, and you guys should accept. And they caused problem. They polarized them even further. They did not help. That was actually the wrong approach to conflict resolution. This is what we say. Earlier engagements, more serious engagement, more constructive uh, engagement, and making everybody trust that you're actually stabilizing, and then stay with it until the crisis is over. The crisis is not over. And the deadlock of 20th of August continued. I think it was a good thing that it continued because it was itself a solution for the time being until a better environment comes up, better <laughs> negotiation terms. But the problem happened is that that deadlock then led to more deadlock and then now uh, uh, eruption of certain violence and, and then uh, this, this uh, threat of dismantling the coalition government. So all of these are incrementally, if you look back, could have been avoided. Now, I said it, left alone, our guys will not deal with it. They are incapable of conflict resolution on their own. But who is better, in a better position to help them than the United States? Pa uh, trusted, friend, superpower, has leverages, has everything. The United States has leverage to say, look, you need my help to help you survive, okay? Well, in that case, do the right thing and I will do more. How about that? Simple. But actually to say, it's your problem, um, and you don't deserve it because you guys dismissed the Speaker of Parliament. It's just wrong approach from a friend. Thank you. Mona? Yeah, Mona Yukubian with USAID. Um, my question is actually along the lines of this conversation, but I, let me preface it first with a comment, which is, um, at least from the standpoint of USAID, our level of engagement in Iraq, certainly it was on a glide path, our mission was on a glide path to closure pre-ISIL. Uh, and in response, we've actually um, 
not only maintain, but we're actually expanding our involvement. We're very engaged on the issue of decentralization, very engaged on stabilization. Um, we work very closely with the Ministry of Oil. We're implementing reforms that could actually result in significant revenue uh, that the government will recoup. Um, so I think it's important to put all of this in context in terms of, of how we're engaged. I think what we struggle with um, is how to engage more effectively. You've started to lay it out a little bit, but at the end of the day, we can't want it more than the Kurds or the Iraqis themselves. And so, you know, Elise's comment, along with completely uh, uh, um, uh, associate myself with, I mean, not, one doesn't want to be patronizing, um, but it's really hard to understand what that balance is of how the U.S. can engage and engage effectively. Understanding the history of, of our involvement, and from a U.S. perspective, you know, a trillion dollars, 170,000 troops on the ground, et cetera, um, where, is, where is that balance? And, and again, what, I think what concerns us is there has to be some level of ownership on the other side. Um, and, I, and I guess I would add one more note, which is some, some real concern about what's happening in the KRG right now. There is violence associated with these protests. Um, and um, our folks up there have witnessed it firsthand. And it is actually impacting our, our ability. We don't do a lot right now with the KRG, but it's impacting our ability to work there. So I, I think that there are some very real uh, impediments but I also think this question of what that balance is and how the U.S. can engage um, in sure. a way that's effective without owning it, because it's not ours to own, uh, I think requires a little more nuance and a little more, frankly, guidance and, and insight from you all. Sure. Um, right. right. Um, I don't think we disagree on, on the principles on, on even the approach, okay? And I don't think anybody could say, here, America, come and do it for us, put on a plate and then go. Um, this is a typical Iraqi approach, I know. Uh, in Baghdad, that's what people said. America is not doing anything when America was sacrificing lives, when America was spending so much money. What I'm suggesting here are two things. One, let's not give ourselves excellent reason why not to do anything. Okay, Let's give ourselves the same reason to do a lot, but enough to stabilize, enough to make the partners on the ground do the right thing. And to me, what is the right thing? Insist on rule of law, and nobody's doing that. Insist on controlling corruption, America is not doing any of that. Insist on democratization and strengthening the institutions of democracy, nobody's doing that. When you help with the Peshmerga, when you help with, when, when America helps with uh, covering uh, aer aerial cover, aerial bombardment, war against ISIS, and so on and so forth. They're doing just about enough to help the Kurds contain ISIS, but not even enough to liberate areas, uh, liberate new villages, and the Kurds are doing it at their own expense, i.e. They are, they are losing more lives because they are doing that. And if America is absolutely clear about its strategy, tell the Kurds, we want you to degrade ISIS, therefore go and liberate those lands, and we give you what it takes, and that's whatever equipment. But I believe that has not happened. But importantly, when you give them that help, make it conditional on our leaders to do the right thing, and that's institutionalized Peshmerga. Why can't the United States say, okay, Kurdish leaders, you asked me for so much weapon, so much this, so much that, and more and more and more, and your shopping list grows. How about you in return doing what it takes to become a, an excellent part to us? I'm speaking as a, as a as a think tank person or as an individual, I'm not speaking as a KRG person, I've never been a KRG person, I was in the government, yes, I'm not in the government, and, and if anybody speaks for the government, it would be Bayan Khan. <laughs> so I, I don't think she would agree with me when I say make this help conditional on the Kurdish leaders doing the right thing, but, but if you don't do that, it's quite clear that America needs partnership with Kurdistan. America cannot afford to lose Kurdistan as well as Baghdad because America has lost Baghdad. No matter what you think of the relations with Abadi, this is not America. And Abadi is not pro-American, okay? Let's not fool ourselves. Iran is in charge. Therefore, losing Kurdistan 
and no um, uh, major influence over Turkey, no major influence over Syria, serious uh, 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 characters or actors on the ground. Uh, very minimal influence in Baghdad. What are the leverages that Baghdad, uh, America has now with Baghdad? Very, very minimal. So you lose the Middle East. And to say, okay, we don't need the Middle East anymore. Now Southeast Asia is more important. Well, what have you done in Southeast Asia to actually secure great interest? Essentially, we are saying Middle East is important for the globe with the radicalism affecting everybody, terrorism affecting everybody, and the oil and this, the well-being, the stability, the peace. Does that not mean we need to be more on the ground and, and helping the partners. Now, nobody says come and rule Kurdistan for us, and we do not want you to. Okay. But actually to say, grow up, you do the right thing, then I come and help you, well, it will not happen, because we know our people. They come out of a background of violence, of um, uh, dictatorships, um, this area. No two communities trust each other. Sunnis don't trust the Kurds for ruling them and don't trust the Shias and then the Shias are now they had good relations with the Kurds are not as much they don't uh, like each other anymore so nobody th it's a fragmentation what I'm saying as, a, as an individual rather than as, a, as anybody associated with any government we are impartial in that sense we in Kurdistan as well as in Iraq what unites us and what divides us are equally strong left alone one day we unite one day we divide and we have not yet done enough to go deep, bottom-up, to unite our communities. Our two administrations are united at the top. It's just the, the top. But deep down, they're still divided. Finance is divided. Decision on, on governance, on, on finances, on economy, on security, on Peshmerga, on intelligence. Everything's divided. Now, when you have a divided nation, they're determined to unite. And, and, and when you're saying Kurds should do more, what else can they do when they came out of a complete internal almost civil war? But in 1998, they stopped that. And then there was a strategic agreement between Taliban and Barzani, between KDP and UK. And guess what? That strategic agreement built enough confidence that it lasted 10 years. That dose of built confidence lasted 10 years where they could rule together, have a coalition, agree on everything. It doesn't matter how good or bad that strategic vote. But it did stop fighting. It did lead to some unity. Now is the time to redefine the strategic agreement, redefine the future, find a new formula for the next 10 years. And that has to be assisted. If not, the factors of division are there waiting for us to then descend into further escalation. So the Kurds have done what it takes to put the violence behind us. We've done enough to actually just look at Hamas and Fatah. Gaza, it's been 10 years or something they have been divided. And how long more do you think? Will they ever unite? Well, the Kurds actually uh, managed to, in 1991, issued a, an amnesty to every mercenary that were at least two or 300,000 of them. They could have been slaughtered, but there was an amnesty saying, no, we need to unite these communities. And then in, 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 in 2000, after the 2000s, there was a strategic agreement. Now, everybody's committed not to let this go downhill, but it can go downhill because we've seen what happens in Turkey, what happens in Baghdad. We are capable of making it go downhill. But a friend, a stabilizer, to be in the middle and have leverages and use them and say, right, you either do what you, what you preach or you, the consequences are there. So, you could see that there is, it is sophisticated, there is a balance, yes, um, what you said, I don't disagree, but actually that doesn't mean we should withdraw and leave it all to them, because it may never happen. That's why we need engagement, and of course the question then is, what can we do? Plenty. We can debate this for another hour, say exactly what you could do, without really losing your impartiality, and without being involved in a quagmire that has no end, without you really sacrificing any more. But as things stand, we think that it is absolutely minimalistic approach. And we as people of Kurdistan are suffering because our leaders are not doing it. We, are, we want rule of law, we are not getting it. We want more democracy, it's stagnating. We want more human rights, women's rights. They are slow. Institutionalization, reforming of the Peshmerga, reform of the police, they're slow, they're not happening. Restructuring the economy, not happening. America can do a lot more to in stimulate that and help with it as well. 
Thank you. Sorry. Before I take uh, Rob's question, I'm going to make sure that see Eli or Sam have any uh, thing that you want to. I'll just may maybe quickly flip it as a as a reverse question to since we're here and we're, we're not here very often. Um, I think you're right. Um, you know, it, it's, it's up for the U.S. to really understand what their engagement would be, and it's going to be far more nuanced. You know. Um, and it's got to be very, very subtle in a lot of ways. But what I would ask to, to these people, maybe just a, a point, is um, what I've heard of Sat and Nabil over the last year and a half with all the internationals coming through is a catchphrase from every one of them is territorial integrity, territorial integrity, territorial integrity. And talking to uh, some very senior level military trainers um, working with the Peshmerga, they were very clear on the... the their view of the engagement, um, these are not necessarily Americans, I will say, um, they're very, very clear on their level of engagement with the Peshmerga is this is going to be under the umbrella of the Iraqi army because um, we don't want to be doing anything that can possibly contributing to the independent state of Kurdistan in any way like that. Um, so what I would ask is, is, is that a shackle to, to U.S. involvement in the Kurdistan region? Is that something that, that they have to bear in mind because they're thinking of Iraq as a whole, and they, that, that constructive engagement there, there's a worry there if they build the, the, the d democratic system, rule of law, you know, if they assist in those levels, will that, oh, we're contributing to an independent state of Kurdistan, we have to think about that? I mean, I'm, I'm just going to pose that as a question to the room, because I'd be interested to hear your views as people based in Washington on that. But sorry, so that's just a related... To yeah, yeah. Well, I think that the formal answer would be one country, one territorial integrity. I think the answer to that is easy. I'm not representing yeah, yeah, the yeah. U.S. government <laughs> here, but uh, the answer is most likely. And the question is, how do you change that? And uh, uh, I think many people around town have been trying to say, look, fighting ISIL is not uh, is a limited scope. Uh, the U.S. not being present is a limited scope. There is far more in between, as a professor said. Uh, and that change of policy takes probably so many conversations like this to expand on why is there is a benefit of changing the scope to, to more. Um, Rob? Hi, I'm Rob Jenkins. I work with Mona at USAID. And it's a, the question that you asked is very interesting. I'd love to hear others people answer it. Because um, I am representing the US government. I'll let someone else answer that question. Uh, it's surprising to hear people talk about the U.S. government responding in Iraq in a nuanced, sophisticated, subtle way, or thinking that we can do that. It's made, that's a nice challenge for us um, to engage in a way that's constructive. Um, Ali, you, you talked a bit, you mentioned a conversation you guys were having before this, that things cannot, you said, things will not escalate further, and that uh, they will stabilize themselves somehow which sounds a little bit contradictory to what you were just saying. So if things can't escalate because of whatever, what, what are those dynamics that are built into this? Should we be worried or should we think this is just part of the, the transition that you guys are going through and with a friend who maybe conditions some assistance, uh, you can make your way through this? Or is it as frightening as, is, I've been watching the region for a long time. Yesterday I sort of woke up to the fact of what's going on right now in Kirish. <laughs> in the KRG, and it's, it's frightening for us. Should I be frightened? Okay, well, um, I think that uh, what I tried to tell you is that we have the equal strength as a factors of that unify us and divide us. And um, the, our confidence in our leaders was that they are very experienced. They have suffered from the dark days of the 90s. Now they have grown out of these things, not just from experience and political maturity, but also their interests, the the businesses that are out there. They cannot afford to ruin it all. They they are their houses are built in glass, all of them. Okay, what could what happened in the 90s, even at, at one percent of that happening, will ruin their infrastructure. So they all know they they are the best, the, the, the first losers from this. So they can't afford, but yet nevertheless they do. Because the bargaining and using cards and strength there is exhibition of muscle. It's not so much how clever you are in tricking them. But it's more like uh, people think that if you poise and if you are seen to be in, in, in a strong position of strength, then, then you're more likely to get what you want. 
but the the other thing is that when um, when the United States if uh, came in at, at the point to do something about it, they did the wrong thing. Uh, let me just be very frank. They approached it the wrong way. Whereas they could have arrived early, understood the subject, dealt with it in a more sophisticated manner, stayed with it, and seen through it. But of course, that doesn't guarantee that everybody was do would have done exactly what the United States says. But at least the United States would have been engaged in a constructive way and not had been mistrusted by half of them and trusted by one half. Okay, so I'm more than happy to indulge deeper into these details uh, uh, after the meeting, and I did not hesitate to say that when I met some officials in the State Department. So I, I believe in this, and I say it publicly as well as privately. The, the key thing about this um, latest episode, I, I would like to give you some background about this to help you understand where we are with the presidency issue. And um, I mentioned it, a couple of people here might, might have already heard me saying it. The, the, the crunch or the root cause of this current crisis is nothing to do with the president. It's to do with power between being shared. What that means is that over the past four decades, the dynamics of power sharing have not, has not changed. PUK, KDP between them commanded and owned the decision-making process. Even when Goran emerged, Islamists emerged, that has not changed. It's now time to change. That's what people say. That's where the, the issue is. What happened in 2007, PUK broke away into two arms. 2009, Goran came to the, to the parliament with 25 votes. Four years later, they gathered momentum and support from Islamists, and they secured one-third of the parliament together. Everybody's bet was that they will disappear because they don't have money, they don't have armed forces, but they didn't. They survived uh, two terms and came to the government. They promised their followers in their manifesto that they will introduce major changes and institutionalize KRG. But a year and a half later, they failed to do all of that. Why? Because the barriers were much greater than that. What they realized is that entering the government is not the same as entering power, because power and government are two different things. In Soleimani, they came first. They were not allowed to even inaugurate their own governor. So that is PUK that came third, stopped them from having a governor, and PUK that came third still owns 50% of decision-making. So Goran, in three years' time, would have disappeared if they had carried on waiting for that, unable to change, unable to translate manifesto in, into real delivery, yet uh, they are in the government, in a coalition government. And K KDP stopped P Goran, uh, through bureaucratic, bureaucracy, through whatever other means, from actually uh, 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 being able to radically change the system irrespective of just because they promised in their manifesto. So what happened? Goran was losing support, losing voters, disillusioned voters. And then they were waiting for an opportunity to reverse that trend. And that opportunity came in the form of President wanting his term renewed. So they took him by the by the by the collar and said, okay, you want to be president for another two years? How much? How much power would you be happy to devolve? The president was happy and the KDP were happy to relinquish some power by the deadline of 20th of August. But not all of what the opposition wanted. And the opposition wanted not that, but they wanted all. So they could not reach the middle. That polarized the nation. They they, were, they put themselves, they cornered themselves in a, in a place where they could not tell the public, okay, now we compromise, because they pushed everybody to polarization. So the deadline was passed, they reached a deadlock, and then suddenly it was all personalized. This personalization meant KDP said, okay, nothing. You lo lost the momentum, I'm not going to give you anything. And Goran says, okay, if you don't give me nothing, I can make you. And that's where these show of strength and exhibition of power and eruption of violence here and there. These are all threats. I was confident, and I'm still confident, that the leaders would not allow this to descend into absolute chaos because nobody wants that. And everybody's committed to the process of democracy still. Everybody's committed to election. Everybody's committed to having government, parliament, so on. But you never know with us. They can incrementally, gradually, but definitely, let this deteriorate gradually, and then all it takes is a bunch of crazy radicals to 
And all it takes, it could be that Iran comes in and say, okay, right, well, that's, that's uh, fertile ground. And, uh, uh, and we have enough potential for having radicals emerging. Why should we let that happen? And Iran suddenly became the good guy and came and said, let me mediate. And then everybody else comes in. Now, do you see that there's no contradiction between saying our leaders will not allow this to uh, deteriorate, but then again it can do? Because that's what we thought about Turkey. That's the story of the Middle East. <laughs> 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 yeah. we, we, I hope we've learned that lesson, that, yeah. that you can't rely on institutions. Uh, we are in a, a completely different phase. Power, the nature of power itself has changed. And so to, to say that leaders and institutions aren't interested in descending into chaos, unfortunately, is not an opportunity. Because the depth of the institution and the solidity of that is not sufficient, not grown enough, not matured. Democracy has not arrived long enough to make them play within the rules of sovereign law. You need to assist in that over a whole decade, maybe. It's not like a one episode, I told them so. It is an evolution. Should we be with them? Should America engage with them to make it evolve in the right way? And that's why I said, shape the future, shape the new order. Or should we say, they are big enough grown-ups, let them do it, and they, can, they know where we are if they need help. It doesn't work like that. It needs, you, you need to shape the future with them. Stabilize, democratize. Every leader in Kurdistan, as well as every individual on the street, are committed and aspired to, to have democracy in Kurdistan. But none of them know how. Because they only know one way of power dynamics and winning what they want. Well... If they are committed, take them by their own word and help them uh, along the way. And they do trust the United States. That's important. It's different from the old Iraq where every American was a potential uh, spy until proved otherwise. In Kurdistan, every spy is welcome until they are bad guys. Okay? <laughs> well, on that note, <laughs> um, I want to be respectful of uh, people's time. I know that you're just warming up to the, to the discussion, but uh, I want to... Uh, my uh, personal conviction and takeaway from this conversation is that I think a shared responsibility uh, of what the, the, the Iraqis, the Kurds, and the people in the Middle East can do and should do, and the help of the, 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 the international community is, in, is a shared responsibility. And finding that formula is, has been a tricky one. So I think this is an area that needs work. And second thing, uh, the depth of institutions, I think that is, is that, that's important. I have seen that where genuine desire could be shocked and taken by surprise. And uh, uh, I think that is important to, to, to continue building that institution, and not just at the moments of emergency to, to jump in, save the day, and leave until another emergency happens. And the third thing I, I think I, I would stress is that just looking at what is the hot spot uh, may distract uh, from take, p p focusing on areas of stability. That may change, their situation may change for other reasons. We have to have a wider <coughs> lens to look at uh, what, what's happening. So if you are really want to win against ISIL, you have to preserve what is stable and help it grow uh, to, uh, to support what you are doing and as a model that you contrast with, with, with the others. So with that, I know, uh, Ray, I had a question. I probably, after this, uh, let me conclude the roundtable uh, and ask you a question. And please join me in a round of applause and thanking our panelists for <laughs> an excellent thank you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.